Howdy, and welcome to Wise About Texas, the Texas History Podcast. Thank you for pulling up a chair to join me in talking about Texas history today. And the podcast is going to try something new today. As you may know, last week was our one-year anniversary. I dropped a little bonus episode on November 2nd to commemorate that milestone. And for the past year, I've worked very hard to bring you journal-level scholarship and back porch storytelling. And I think it's worked out pretty well. But as much fun as I'm having with this podcast and as much work as I'm putting into it, I'm trying not to masquerade as an academic. I do believe that Texas has more than its fair share of amateur historians, but there is a tremendous professional history community in this state. And I wanted to give you a peek behind the curtain and talk to a professional historian about how the pros approach Texas history and create all of the great scholarships, the books, the museums, the films that we all love. So for today's episode, I interviewed professional historian Dr. Jody Edward Ginn. Now, Dr. Ginn got his master's from Texas State University and a Ph.D. from the University of North Texas. Dr. Ginn began his career in law enforcement, of all things, but he went from being an investigator for a Central Texas district attorney to a professional historian. Dr. Ginn has worked with many great history institutions, including the Bryan Museum, the former Texas Ranger Foundation, the Texas Historical Commission, and many others, while also being published many times on various topics in Texas history. And he is recognized currently as one of the premier Texas Ranger scholars in the United States. And in this interview, you're going to hear about how and why someone goes into the field of professional history, how professionals do their research. We'll even hear a little about some Texas Ranger history and even the first movie made in Texas. Dr. Ginn will inform you how to get involved in the history community and why Texas history is so important. Now, those of you who are longtime listeners will realize that this is the first of hopefully many many interviews that I'll be doing as this podcast continues to grow. But I got to tell you, the audio in this episode might sound a little strange in your speakers. I interviewed Dr. Ginn on two different occasions, once in Austin in person and once over Skype. So I just ask you to uh, be a little patient with the audio production. I'm a historian, not an engineer, but don't worry, you'll be able to hear Dr. Ginn loud and clear. So let's go meet Dr. Jody Edward Ginn and get wise about Texas. Dr. Ginn, first of all, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us on Wise About Texas. It's great to have you here. Thanks. Great to be here. Well, tell us, I'm going to jump right into it. Tell us why you love Texas history. Well, I, I believe I love Texas history for about the same reason that everybody does, and that's my personal connection to it. Uh, um, yeah, my, my ancestors first came to Texas as citizens of, of the Republic of Mexico and during the Texas Revolution served in uh, Wiley Martin's company. All right. Well, Dr. Ginn, would give us a rundown of what degrees you hold that make you a professional historian. Well, um, the uh, the graduate work is where I went into history. I had a bachelor's in criminal justice for my law enforcement career, and uh, but my master's is in what's called public history, and that is uh, geared towards projects that bring history to the public as as opposed to a traditional academic who simply uh, uh, teaches in university and um, and you know and then and publishes academic monographs. Okay, so you've got your Ph.D., your master's and your Ph.D. Uh, Tell us a little bit about what projects you've worked on and uh, what you're currently working on. Graduate school, I I began consulting on a variety of projects. It began with archival research. Of course, as a historian, I, you know, naturally developed a lot of experience in in my law enforcement careers. We discussed uh, in in, uh, records research and archival research. So that's kind of how it started. And that research was has been geared towards um, developing content for product uh, historical projects uh, in, on various media. Uh, many of them were book projects, but then it grew into documentary film, educational series, and uh, museums and that sort of thing as well. So, what uh, what sort of museum work have you done? Well, I've done some discrete exhibits uh, in the past, including I did. Uh, one for the Alamo back in 2014, the Tejanos at the Alamo that uh, was a temporary exhibit over uh, what they call the High Holy Days. That's the anniversary of the siege and battle. Uh, I did a small exhibit. Uh, originally, my very first exhibit was on my ancestor, the ranger. That's uh, a traveling exhibit that moved around in it, but has been for some time at the Buckhorn Museum in San Antonio. 
But then uh, I really uh, catapulted after the PhD. I, I was hired on um, by a, a previous client who had done uh, research work for, uh, and that's uh, J.P. Bryan and the new Bryan Museum down in Galveston. And I was their historical consultant that wrote uh, their uh, all the text for their exhibits and then also many of their artifact labels and also wrote and produced uh, three videos for them that play as a part of their exhibits. Well, you did a heck of a job with the Bryan Museum. That's one of my favorite places. I've mentioned it several times on this podcast, and it's just a spectacular piece of work, and I'm interested to learn what an integral role you played. You mentioned your ancestor, the ranger, and I want to get to that as a way to discuss how you do your research. But before that, you mentioned earlier movies. Tell us a little bit about the movies that you work on. Well, um, that's kind of how I I ended up in this career shift is I started working on a project to uh, to develop a series on the complete history of the Rangers based on Robert M. Utley's two volume series. That's the modern general scholarship, the general history of, of, of both the first two centuries of the Rangers. And that got me in partnership with a company in Austin, a longstanding film company in Austin uh, named Elephant Productions. And it also got me involved with the former Texas Rangers Foundation. And they were developing educational programs for fourth and seventh graders primarily, uh, and but also geared to, in some degree to, to uh, high school kids. And they wanted a, a video educational series to, to, uh, to do that. So we did the first uh, part of that back in 2009, and it actually involved both history and modern-day rangers and crime scene investigation techniques and that sort of thing. So it really crossed, again, with, with both my previous career and my, and my current one to do the history and uh, then also modern law enforcement techniques. And so after I was hired at the Bryan Museum for the basic script uh, text and so forth, uh, then they, when they found out about our, uh, my production background, and then they hired my partners and I to uh, to do that part as well. And so we have a there's an introductory piece that is Mr. Bryan himself welcoming visitors and kind of talking about his interest and his view why he you know collected all those things over the years. And then there is a piece on the 1900 storm, the Galveston 1900 storm, which the building in that the museum is housed in uh, survived that storm. It's one of the few few that from that time that did. And uh, then the last piece is geared towards kids in the kids' area downstairs. I want to ask you this. Why do you think it's important that we study Texas history and learn about Texas history? Well, I think it's important because Texas is what in academia is is popularly referred to as a transnational borderlands region. And it is to this day. It's, 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 it's It's a region of... Uh, the Western Hemisphere, where multiple peoples, multiple cultures, economies, and so forth all come together. And they've come together, and they've collaborated, they've cooperated, and they've at times conflicted. And uh, and, and it's the the center uh, of the development of the, especially the Western United States and North America generally. And, and, and so, the, the, you know, the significance of, of, of what has transpired here to, to build, you know, the, the, the economies and, and cultures and populations of North America, you know, is, is, I think is indisputable. Well, I think those of us that, that do go back a ways in Texas certainly love the history, but you decided to actually change careers and pursue it as a professional. What made you decide to change your career and go and become a professional historian? Well, the, my I started out as what you refer to as an avocational historian. I started on a personal project on an ancestor who was a Texas Ranger in the 1930s. And uh, in that process uh, of researching my ancestor, I made connections with individuals who um, introduced me to the field of history and And so the individuals who introduced me to the field of history through organizations like the Texas State Historical Association, increasing my increasing involvement uh, led me to to make that leap. I I, I found that it was possible. It was a field that I was had no uh, direct connection to before. And as I made those connections and and learned more about it, just decided that it was the, the path for me. And part of it was luck of the opportunity to be able to do it at the right time. 
And as I told the listeners before we started the interview, you were in law enforcement for many years. And what is it about academic history that made it so much more attractive to you than law enforcement? Well, you know, a lot of people, when they, when they hear that, they say, wow, that's that's such a leap. But in fact, it, it's really not. I do things, I was an investigator at the DA's office, the district attorney's office in the end. What I do is uh, now is simply investigating events that happened much longer ago. And I'm not using the same burden of proof. We're not looking at beyond a reasonable doubt, but we certainly are looking at a preponderance of the evidence. I don't like to make historical claims or uh, cast aspersions without uh, sufficient evidence. Well, it's interesting you talk that way. I think you're doing that on purpose, given my day job as a judge. <laughs> but let's let me just ask you directly, what is the burden of proof that you use as a professional historian, and is it different depending on what you're writing or talking about? Well, the key is how I present it, how I characterize it, and 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 how I claim it. And this is this is the big thing: is you know we're not putting anybody in jail here, but I mean you certainly can sully someone's reputation, and so I, I'm I'm not going to as I say make claims or accusations against uh, someone or or a group or individuals uh, without certainly without a, a preponderance of the evidence. If, if you know, clear and convincing evidence, even, but uh, the, the, but the, like I say, characterization also matters. Is the fact is is that full evidence isn't always going to be possible, and uh, I uh, have have always practiced, and I encourage my colleagues to practice being able to say we don't know, and there are, there are many events in history where you know at this current time uh, we don't have the full evidence, but perhaps in the future. That evidence will surface, and somebody in the, can can say something more decisive about an event. But uh, so we often we have to, um, to to be willing to say we don't know. Well, the burdens of proof, uh, the preponderance of the evidence is more likely than not. Standard is the lowest in the law. Would you say it's the lowest for a historian? You've got to have you got to have something to go on, and if so. What do you look for? What's enough to go on? What type of stuff that you would find? Well, every individual historian, there are no, you know, hard and fast laws that can be enforced to require that. So every in individual historian has to make that choice for themselves. And and some, uh, unfortunately, are, uh, you know, have lower standards than others, in my opinion. You know, I, I'm looking for as much it's, it's not just a piece of evidence, but then corroborating evidence, you know, um, because, you know, we all know that you, you can always have just one one viewpoint, one statement, one word, one person's side of the story, and it can be made to look sound very convincing. But uh, if you don't have something to corroborate that or to contradict it, uh, that's what I spent time uh, in my dissertation doing uh, in, in several cases is I took the full accounts and claims of the various actors involved in the events that I was studying, and I researched each of them thoroughly and then applied my, my critique, my judgment based on uh, the evidence. So I presented their arguments, I presented their claims, but then I discussed what evidence, and sometimes that's all it is. It's not necessarily about making the final judgment. I can let the readers do that. I'm happy to let the readers do that. And, and I think most of my colleagues that are of a similar mindset that, you know, it's, it's not so much about drawing the final conclusion on all of these events, but um, just presenting presenting what, what we do know. And as far as judgments, a lot of times it's up to the reader to decide. Well, I do want to get to your dissertation because that's sort of the difference between an amateur historian and a professional historian uh, and everything that you just discussed. You know, an amateur historian wants the story. They want to tell a fun story. A professional historian wants to tell a fun story, maybe, but more importantly wants to present evidence of what happened in the past and maybe how it affects what's happening in the present and perhaps even the future. But before we get to what what made you a professional, so to speak, let's talk about those sources where you find that evidence. When you as a professional historian decide on a topic, where do you go? What are the sources that you look to? Well, there's a very wide range. Um, it begins with just personal resources. My dissertation uh, began as personal research into an ancestor, as I mentioned. And so I started uh, with relatives, and some of them, uh, including one key individual's uh, daughter, um, had a scrapbook which contained photos and 
newspaper articles uh, from the time and other documents, even even, even uh, official documents like his uh, Texas Ranger identification, which was at the time known as a warrant of authority. And and so you, you kind of start you can you can start anywhere uh, you can. But that's that's a key place is, you know, there is a lot of there are a lot of documents that are still in private hands. And uh, and if they don't get thrown away, uh, which many, many sadly do, then uh, they can be an invaluable resource. And some of these some of these items I was not able to duplicate anywhere else in my over 15 years of research that followed. Uh, From there, I started going to the more official, the more well-known places, the archives, the uh, Texas State Archives. Uh, was uh, was the primary that's where I found the most not only uh, general uh, data about and d- documents from the period about rangers uh, such as the records of warrants of authority and a list of, of rangers who served at the time and that sort of thing that verified who was who and who was actually you know involved at any given period because there was a lot of change at that point but also court records uh, the Texas State Archives has all of the courts of appeals records uh, going back to the Republic. And I found in this particular case five complete trial transcripts uh, that were appealed to the Court of Criminal Appeals. They involved some, you know, really unique and and unexpected um, events uh, in, in the case. Three of these cases were uh, cases, now this is set in 1935 in uh, San Augustine, Texas, what we consider deep east Texas, behind the Pine Curtain, if you've ever heard that term. And these um, were cases were all white juries. This is the height of Jim Crow. And all white juries convicted white men solely on the testimony of black victims and witnesses. Victims and witnesses who did not have to be allowed at that time legally to even testify. Jody, I'm going to jump in. You've now teased the listeners mercilessly. You've used (laughs) terms like Texas Rangers, and you've gotten into some exciting testimony, so we can't leave them hanging. Why don't you tell us what your dissertation was? It it turned out that what made you a professional was also the same project that got you involved in Texas history and caused a career change. So tell us about this ancestor that had such a powerful effect on the direction of your life, and then we're going to go right back behind the pine curtain to those court cases. Who was it? Well, his name was Dan Hines, and he was my great-grandmother's brother. Now, my great-grandmother lived to be 96 years old, and she passed away when I was almost 21. And so I grew up hearing, uh, you know, anecdotes of his service. uh, But all I could recall by the time I started this research was that he had gone into a town in East Texas and, and, quote, cleaned it up, and he was given a pair of pistols as a as a reward for his service there always a good gift oh yeah state-of-the-art 357 magnums uh (laughs) so what was his uh what was sort of the arc of his career uh dan was a cowboy at heart he uh, was born he was breaking horses for pay by the time he was 12 Uh, by the time he was in his 20s he was managing the bassett blakely ranch uh, land that is now the seat part of the cinco ranch development over in fort bend county um, that was a, a well, I forget the exact size. It was several thousand acres, and uh, it had a, a, a extensive herd of longhorns, one of the last of that time of that size. And so, in the 1920s, as as the as the uh, uh, foreman on that ranch, he was the uh, in the movie, the first movie ever made in Texas, called North of 36, based on the Emerson Howe epic. What year was that? 1924. Ernest Torrance, Noah Beery. These these kind of folks were in there, and uh, and he so he was the both a technical advisor as you know run and then because I, these cowboys had to be actually there to run that herd you couldn't have actors doing it right. and so uh, so he's in the movie as well though it's of course not credited they they the credits were pretty they didn't credit near as many people as they do now so he um, but but like a lot of cowboys when the depression hit uh, he turned to law enforcement as a way to make an income. And uh, I believe the connection was actually through my great grandfather, my great grandmother's husband, uh, who was a deputy sheriff in Harris County at the time. 
and for the rest of his career until the 60s when he passed. And so Dan uh, initially worked as what's called a special ranger. That is not a Texas ranger, uh, though it is, it, it's commonly linked because of the similar terminology, but it's a separate thing. And th- these folks were typically uh, in, um, working for railroads or oil companies or the cattle association, that sort of thing. And so he started out and he was doing undercover work uh, under, the, under the authority of, uh, of the famous you know, Ranger Captain Frank Hamer and the Adjutant General William Warren Sterling. And so then he ended up in East Texas as a Texas Ranger. He did. Um, he was sent out to do undercover work in the oil fields, and he was working uh, with a fellow known, known named Ed Clark, who was an assistant attorney general under James V. Allred. And when James V. Allred became governor, he made Hines a regular Texas Ranger. And so back to the sources that you were using to write about Ranger Hines, you were going to trial transcripts that revealed some fascinating societal relationships. So go back and tell us more about that. Right. So, you know, in in uh, uh, current day historiography, uh, uh, in, in among professionals, there's there's been a consensus for a while that that uh, rangers during this time period of the late 19th, early 20th century, more often than not, were um, mistreating, if not outright victimizing, uh, minorities uh, rather than protecting them. But uh, a lot of my research is is revealing quite the opposite. Now, it depends on which ranger at which given time. And as Robert M. Utley said in Lone Star Lawman and Lone Star Justice, the, 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 the quality of the captain determined the quality of the ranger, determined the quality of the work that was done, and, uh, and that sort of thing. And I, I found this very much to, to, to be um, backed by the evidence the further I go into this. So in San Augustine, um, and there are people alive today that, that were, were young adults uh, and, and can attest to this and do uh, state that the, the rangers under James Allred, including Dan Hines, came in there and they, they uh, protected the, the, the rights and, and provided a, an opportunity to seek justice through the court system uh, for these African-American citizens, uh, as said before, in the height of Jim Crow. And those, those cases were heard. Uh, juries convicted, and the uh, Court of Criminal Appeals upheld those convictions. And so a court records often play an important role in telling the story of this of a society, which is why one of the things that got me so passionate about Texas history was being a judge and trying to preserve some of the historic court records of the Republic in Harris County. And we found fascinating stories, including uh, at the height of slavery in Texas, a slave that sued and won her freedom, in a similar situation with an all-white male property-owning jury. So uh, there tend to be lots of myths and modern stereotypes about what actually happened back then, which is, I guess, what motivates a professional like yourself to go back and dig through those sources. Absolutely. I mean, skepticism is at the heart of it all. You know, we're, we're seeking out, do what is what we think we know about the past a a, a true and accurate and full picture. So tell us what other kinds of sources that you would look at to, um, and we'll go back and use your dissertation, what other sorts of sources did you use for that? Well, newspaper articles very often, it depends on the type of event and circumstances and, and individuals you're dealing with. And in my case, this, the, these were events that were heavily covered, uh, especially on, on the back end, uh, in the press, uh, both local in San Augustine, but also in Houston and Dallas, even Austin to, to, and, and some surrounding areas. Uh, again, through another individual, uh, I, I got a hold of a, a small cache of, of newspaper articles from even into Lu- uh, uh, western Louisiana about some of these events that Heinz was involved in, uh, again, that I've not been able to find duplicate anywhere. We'll throw a bone to the amateur historians uh, because I'm one and then I'm going to ask you the ultimate question but tell an amateur historian listening who wants to start researching what are the top three to five things to do tomorrow to go look at look up their ancestor or historical event. Well the very first thing is to seek out existing secondary sources. That's publications, especially books, but not just books. I mean, you, it could be uh, 
uh, articles, journal articles. Um, as a professional, we prefer more professional publications that have been peer reviewed. But you know that, that you can learn a little bit from anywhere, and it's uh, again about corroborating whatever you do find. But um, but the key is is to um, familiarize yourself with the existing scholarship. You know what do we already know. And, uh, and, and that's, that's where you need to start. From there, you can build on. In fact, it makes your job a lot easier because um, a, lot of, a lot of people that are not professional historians presumably don't pay a lot of attention to the footnotes. You know, it's often said, it's a said among historians that, you know, it's, it's that only our colleagues that are critiquing us are going to be paying any attention to our footnotes. But if you're an avocational uh, historian, you should definitely be looking at those footnotes because that can point you in the direction of potential resources. Because... And, 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 and don't assume that because something about that topic has been published already, that doesn't mean, I mean, they pulled exactly what was related to their particular thesis or their story that they were dealing with. They would have looked through countless pages of materials that could, ha- could, withhold, could hold all kinds of, of gold mines uh, historically that, that might relate to what you're looking at. Has um, you used a term? I want you to define for the listeners historiography. What does that mean? That is the uh, the existing scholarship. That is the you know historiography is is publications on a historical topic. For me, there was almost no historiography on San Augustine uh, minus one book uh, from the mid nineties. Uh, by a late scholar, which was built only on a few um, oral histories. All right. Well, I talked about the ultimate question. Here it is. As a professional historian, what do professional historians think of avocational historians, and how do the two intersect? Uh, reveal those secrets for us. Well, it, it really depends. There's there's a breadth of opinion on that matter. There are some professional historians uh, who will tell you, you know, look, I, I'm I'm not interested in the public. I'm not interested in avocational historians. I research and I write to, you know, a half a dozen or more people in my field, you know, around the country or around the world. And that's it. Uh, And those people don't tend to have a lot of regard for avocational historians. But there are plenty who do. And their their main concern is that, you know, that that avocational historians um, get to know and understand some basics about historical research and writing. Um, you don't necessarily have to do it through a formal education, but, uh, you know, if you're going to, if you're, you know, you've got to be a little bit of an autodidact and, and, and learn, you know, make the effort to learn yourself. I started, as I said, as an avocational historian, and I got to the point where I realized that if I want to really do this well and make a career of it, then uh, then I, I, I want to get that training. And, and, and again, through luck, uh, of, of certain circumstances was able to make that happen. And so here I am. Do you think Texas has more avocational historians than other places? It seems that more Texans are interested in their history than maybe other people in other locations. What do you think about that? Well, you know, that question is the perfect example of the difference between many professional versus avocational historians is that most professional historians want to avoid claims of more or most or best or greatest or what have you, (laughs) uh, or worst or least or any of those sort of things, because they can be very difficult to prove. And so um, I would say that it's a fair guess that Texas, given the, the intrigue that, that uh, is surrounding its history, given the, the level of interest, given the size of the population uh, in comparison to most states, that, uh, that there probably are. Uh, and, and I think the reason is, is that, you know, the, the reason it's a, that Texas history is popular is because people care about it. I, I think a lot of people in a lot of states, um, you know, they just don't have the same level of interest in their state history. Well, I agree with everything you said, but you spoke it like a true academic. So as an avocational <laughs> historian uh, who is shamelessly biased in favor of Texas, I'm going to say we have more and uh, maybe even most. But <laughs> that was great. What um Let's segue into a little bit about Texas Pride, which I exhibited shamelessly just then. I mean, as I said in one of my earlier episodes, this show is wise about Texas and no other place. So what uh, what is it about this Texas Pride that us Texans feel and what's it how did it develop 
through Texas history? That's the tough one. I mean, you know, I think for every individual it's going to be, um, you know, it may have a different story, may have a different reason why they feel that pride. You know, the, 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 the whole concept of the pride comes through the, the, the um, issue of identity. I mean, people identify with their states and Texans identify with the state, with their, with their home state or their adopted state. In, in the case of the many, many immigrants, both nationally and internationally, uh, that have always come here. That and they, it's just that's what makes it unique is the way the the people who live here identify with the state and the region. Well, you've used the word identity, and I do want to talk about uh, your latest project because I think it's a great, uh, very timely, and it's a discussion of professional Texas history and how it relates. Uh, to all of us as Texans, and I'll just introduce it. It's a book called Texan Identities, Moving Beyond Myth, Memory, and Fallacy in Texas History. So I want you to tell us about this project. Yeah, this uh, book was published recently by the University of North Texas Press, and uh, the editors are Dr. Light Cummins of Austin College, also a past uh, state historian of Texas, and Dr. Uh, Mary Shear of uh, the uh, Ch- uh, Lamar University, She's the uh, um, the department chair there, and it started. the The subject came after the basic uh, the the basic concept for this book. First, was to um, to produce a work uh, written by all having all the contributors. This is an anthology, so there's there's uh, several different chapters, and every chapter is written by a different contributor. The editors themselves each contributed a chapter, as well as having written the introduction. But then the, all the subsequent chapters. Uh, are written by um, other scholars. And the connection is, is each of those scholars were individuals who uh, uh, earned a Master of Arts in History from Texas State University. Most of us, when it was still called Southwest Texas State University. Alma mater of Lyndon Baines Johnson, as I recall. Exactly. And um, and then uh, went, but these individuals also went on to get a Ph.D., Elsewhere, because Texas uh, State to this day does not have a Ph.D. program in history, only the master's program. And so all the contributors in this book have that Texas State master's, but went on to get the Ph.D., and I actually was the most junior of that group. When it started, I was still uh, ABD, all but dissertation, and uh, finished my dissertation in in late uh, 2014. So this is a collection of essentially essays uh, by very well-known and accomplished historians, yourself included. And what is the, the title is Texan Identities. What, tell us about the title. What does it mean? Anthologies uh, typically are created to initiate discussion on historical topics. And so they want to offer a variety of perspectives and related topics. So mine is about Texas Rangers in myth and memory, but the others uh, very widely. Uh, there's the Alamo uh, by Dr. Stephen Harden, uh, but there's also ones about you know school integration. There's uh, ones about uh, German Jewish Texans and and so on. And so, but the common theme uh, is the discussion of how is the te- how has the Texan identity developed, and how has it been influenced by myth and collective memory, as we call it. You know, that is the you know what what the public believes about our history. All right. Well, let you use the word myth, and that of course raises all sorts of red flags in some people's mind. Tell us what myth means in the context of Texan identities. Well, myth means that it's either not true or it's at least not proven, such as Dr. Hardin's uh, discussion of the uh, the famous uh, line in the sand by Travis at the Alamo. Uh, to sum it up, there is no corroborating evidence that that ever took place. And, it, and is it one of those things that, uh, and I think I've probably used this line in several of the episodes of Wise About Texas. It may not have happened, but it should have. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so uh, a discussion then of significant factors in Texas history that shape what it means to be Texan. Is that about some Absolutely. Of All right, well, your ancestor was a ranger, and we talked about Ranger Hines. Now let's talk about the chapter you wrote in this book and how the Texas Rangers both myth and memory, shape the identity of Texans. 
Well, Texas Rangers uh, over time have can been come have come to be seen as really the quintessential um, pioneer patriot archetype. Rangers are seen as in in in, in much of the collective memory. Uh, as, uh, as, as really one of two. There's, there's really two perspectives. They're either seen as, you know, the, the heroes uh, who always get their man who, um, and are always on the side of justice. Uh, and, but then there's an opposing view that sees them as nothing more as the strong arm of the establishment. And neither view is, is, is really premised in actual historical evidence. You know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the quality of Ranger depended largely on the quality of the commander, which depended on the quality of the person appointing that commander. And that varied who at the point those commanders and how that came all came about uh, evolved over time. And some of the biggest periods of critique of, of, of Ranger actions happened at a time when they were being highly politicized by governors who had direct power to appoint not only the captains, but they would appoint the rank and file Rangers uh, and even give out those special Ranger commissions I mentioned earlier, uh, upwards into the thousands to people not only not qualified to be in law enforcement, but actual with criminal backgrounds. And some of the bad actors in the San Augustine events were carrying uh, the, that sort of special Ranger commission. So as with probably any organization, it's never all good or all bad, and they evolve, you know, there are good periods Absolutely. and there are bad periods, and the Texas Rangers, heroes that they are to all of us, Texans, are no different, they're susceptible to the same thing. Absolutely, and I think that, that, that people who see them as heroes, you know, have a fair point in saying that while, yes, you know, not all of them have lived up to the ideal, uh, but that that shouldn't take away from those who did. And I found it interesting, I, I read, of course, read your essay, and I found it interesting that you gave very fair treatment to the to the other view, the view that was critical of the Rangers. That isn't any, that isn't a hundred percent accurate. No, absolutely not. And um, you know, again, no no group is is immune to myths. And uh, and I, as a you know, uh, as a former investigator, my approach, as I mentioned, is you know I want to see the evidence, and the evidence simply does not support historical, historically, generally, in my experience with all of the areas that I've researched and that I've studied, you know, sweeping indictments of large groups simply don't hold up to historical scrutiny, and that whether that's Texas Rangers, rather that's a, an ethnic minority, it, you know, sweeping indictments simply don't hold up, as neither does sweeping adulation. Was there anything before you started on the project on your ranger ancestor, was there anything as a young man that sort of made you fall in love with Texas? Maybe a movie or a book or a memory, something like that? I think I was like any any kid. I was intrigued by Texas history. My first, uh, uh, one of my instructors was not particularly good. You know, sometimes in public schools, you know, you get teachers who don't really have any background in Texas history. It's mixed into a... a, a um, social studies curriculum and and so forth and and so you you know if you if you happen to get fortunate enough to to get a teacher who who had a passion for the for texas history then they would have passed that on to you and uh and uh, if not then you know it kind of depends but i was already always connected in in fact uh, a few years ago when going through some old boxes i found my fourth grade texas history pamphlets magazine that i had put together uh and so forth and so I still so that's my first Texas history publication. Well, that's a pretty good start. I don't think you know it took me forty plus years to get to the podcasting moment. So I'd say you were you had a great head start. So it it grabbed me, but it you know my interest in history um, was was actually stoked by broader works that weren't straight history; they were historical fiction. And as I'm really not a fan of of that today as a professional historian because of the liberties that it can take. Um, at the same time, it did. I was a, an avid reader of James Mishner from an early age, passed down by my father and grandfather uh, who were reading these books. And um, also some series, the Wagons West series, uh, which um, had, I forget how many volumes. Uh, you know, I read them in paperback, again, passed down from my father to me. And, and, uh, and then also a series called the White Indian series. You know, and, and, and again, you're, you know, you're talking about uh, dealing with um, the the development uh, in both cases of these series, you're talking at different periods, but you're talking about the development 
of you know what became the United States of America, and so and and Texas is central to that. It, you know, it was it is a transnational borderlands, uh, and it is today. Uh, and and so um, you know, in its place, uh, you know, it's a text by um, Frank de la Teja and some other scholars. Uh, you know, called it a crossroads of North America, and and so you know, it's it is certainly it's. Um, significance can't be really can't be overvalued uh, to the development of North America as a whole. Yeah, and that's always been fascinating to me. One of the things that I've always admired about Texas is we we experienced and when I say we, I'm going back to the 1820s, we experienced real diversity where the strength of a of a first a nation then a state was formed with diverse peoples all working together. Too often these days, we try to split everybody up into groups and pit them against each other. But back in the earliest days of Texas, you had uh, certainly Mexicans, Tejanos, uh, people of Hispanic descent that were, were born and lived in Texas, Germans, Czechs, everybody. And uh, in your professional opinion, uh, has that pervaded to the present day? Well, I think um, I think what's important to understand and and is that for a long time the the contributions uh, you know the the development of Texas in the, in the the early historiography focused on the Anglo's that were present, starting with those that came with Stephen F. Austin. One of the that tends to be one of the most uh, significant criticisms of professional historians of the of both the old uh, historiography and you know and some presented by uh, avocational historians is um, disregarding the contributions of of other groups and other individuals that belonged you know to other groups other than Anglo's and it's not it's I don't while there certainly are people who um, to, you know, modern day groups for various, you know, with various motivations, um, seize on that and and kind of take it in various directions, you know, based on their own agendas. The key is is that these people were here, and they were contributing and have continued to contribute uh, to the development of of modern Texas, and and so it's not about taking away from the Anglo, you know, uh, participants and, and even heroes that, that we're used to. It's about, it's about, you know, sharing the limelight, if you will, with, with others who were also equally involved. Well, I think that's so key because I can tell you as a, as a typical Texan, maybe I'm no. not typical, but um, Texans today who were born and raised um, have experienced in their lives the cultures of all sorts of ethnic groups. I mean, we eat, I've eaten tamales at Christmas my whole life. Well, that didn't come from my German ancestors, and we get kolaches for breakfast thanks to the Czechs. So I think that we benefit from all those cultures, and I think to the extent there were gaps in the historiography, I'm, I'm afraid we might have lost a lot of the rich fabric of Texas history, and I hope... Uh, I know that modern-day perspectives hopefully can go back and reweave some of that. And, that, and that's a, what, as professional historians, what we're trying to do is fill in those gaps and making sure that, that all of, uh, you know, all those who contributed, you know, are recognized so that our children, our grandchildren, our great-great-great-grandchildren will benefit from that knowledge and understand that, you know, that... Texas was not born of culture conflict, which has, you know, long been a, a paradigm, but which professional historians have long rejected. Whether you side with the Anglo's or you side with non-Anglo's, whether it be, you know, um, uh, American Indian groups in Texas or it be uh, Tejanos, you know, Latino Texans, uh, it, it doesn't matter that that, um, that the 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 old notions that that culture conflict was at the core of of the of that history ha, has been rejected by most modern historians and and the fact is is that it was collaboration and and, uh, and cooperation that has built texas and continues to yeah one of the quotes i love from texan identities from Kay goldman who was writing about uh, jewish texans embracing their german roots and she said one of the uh, the title of the essay was on becoming texans she said they, meaning the Jewish German immigrants, they could be culturally German, religiously Jewish, 
and politically Texan. So that struck me as sort of an all are welcome here. And Texas has always been a place where it really didn't matter where you came from. It matters what you do when you get here. Absolutely, absolutely. And you can find examples among the Tejanos are the same. You know, when I was uh, studying at Texas State under Frank de la Teja, I actually crunched the numbers on the participants in the Texas Revolution. And while a lot of uh, early historiography kind of dismisses Tejano participation uh, because the raw numbers seem low in comparison to that of Anglos, uh, you've got to take into account that there were over 30,000 Anglos total present at that time in Texas, while there were only about 3,000. Their, their population had, been, had never been huge, uh, you know, um, and, and had been decimated during the uh, War for Mexican Independence. And so when but when I crunched the numbers and looked at them as a percentage of those populations, it's actually a slightly higher percentage of Tejanos uh, participated in combat in the Texas revolutions than that of the uh, Anglo community. And when you take out the Anglos who had showed up within the last year who were not longstanding colonists, that number grows, that difference grows in the Tejanos favor. And that's. One more example of why it's important that we do have professional historians that are going behind the stories and uh, weaving the fabric of our culture. Describe for us as a professional historian, describe the history community. What, how do professional historians gather? What clubs do they join? Are there opportunities for avocational historians or just people that are interested to join the professionals and learn from them? Tell us about that. Absolutely. In fact, that's exactly how I came and crossed that line from from avocational to professional is by getting involved in those organizations. Organizations, but it's not required, and there are a great many. And the the, the number one, the biggest uh, central organization for Texas history is the Texas State Historical Association. I came into contact with them by accident until I started doing research and and cross paths with some of their materials at the uh, what is now the Briscoe Center for American History, and they were at the time housed in the same building. I had never even heard of them because of not being connected to the field. I found out about them, found out about their fellowship programs that the, that's funding to support research, and um, on a lark, applied for some and and was awarded a, a, a fellowship two years in a row. And so because of that, I became involved with the organization, and I found that it was very much a mix of, of uh, professional historians, but also uh, avocational and also just people who were, uh, you know, history enthusiasts, if you will, who wanted to learn, who wanted to know what was out there. And, uh, and they have, uh, you know, they have book dealers, both new books and used in older books, uh, collectors. Um, it's just a wide range. And so the membership is everything from professional historians to businessmen to just, you know, every from every walk of life, from every, um, you know, profession and so forth, uh, there are people that uh, that attend and get involved at different levels. And they have resources. They, they have the Handbook of Texas, which is now the Handbook of Texas is online. Uh, they digitized it a number of years ago. That was a big part of the project. But it, the, the handbook itself dates back to the mid-20th century when it was first uh, published. And uh, this is information that now, anytime something related to Texas comes up, you'll see You'll read articles from across the country where that's where they'll have done. They'll, they'll cite, they'll, they'll reference the Handbook of Texas. And all again, all that is sponsored and supported uh, by the Texas State Historical Association. Are there, uh, and you'll even see the occasional podcaster there at those conventions too, I would imagine. Um, <laughs> would, uh, are there any other uh, clubs or organizations that you would encourage enthusiastic uh, amateur historians to join. Absolutely. Um, just, you know, in Texas alone, you have not only the TSHA, but then you have the West Texas Historical Association and you have the East Texas Historical Association. I was just at their conference a few weeks ago. Um, all of these is kind of obvious what their areas of emphasis are. But yes, yeah, so you have East Texas, you have West Texas, you have now, even now there's a brand new Central Texas Historical Association. It's sponsored out of Blinn College, uh, led by a colleague of mine, Ken Howell. So these these are all great groups. And then if you have a specialty or if you're interested in museums, there's the Texas Association of Museums and there's uh, Association of State and Local History and 
And uh, so it kind of depends on what your particular interest is, but I would highly recommend that, that any person interested in history consider, you know, seeking out and, and attending uh, any of these groups that, that uh, are of interest to them. Well, Dr. Ginn, give us a little uh, preview of what's on your current plate. What are you working on? And Okay. Well, um, you know, of course, the Texan Identities book just recently came out, and we're you know, promoting that currently. Uh, I have a, a chapter coming out in the spring with uh, Ken Howell, who I mentioned. It's a it's an anthology on uh, the Republic of Texas period, and uh, I have a, a, a chapter in that book, and that's with a lot of, a lot of scholars. Uh, it's a it's oh boy, it's a big book, five hundred some odd pages, and I think thirteen fourteen chapters. It's going to be a very large book, especially in this day and age. Then I have a, a book I co-authored on the Palmetto Ranch battlefield in, in, in near Brownsville. Uh, I did that on contract with the Texas Historical Commission. Uh, William McWhorter, that was my co-author there. He was he was their military sites coordinator. He's now the director of their uh, Holocaust program. Then I also I'm I'm under contract in uh, designing and developing the exhibits for the Texas Rangers Heritage Center, which will be built in Fredericksburg, uh, which is sponsored by the former Texas Rangers Foundation. Well, you've got a lot on your plate. You're obviously very busy, uh, and I want to thank you personally for coming on Wise About Texas. This has been a new adventure for the podcast uh, as we've grown. I thought it was important to bring a, a professional historian on the show, and I really appreciate you spending the time with us today. Well, I really appreciate you having me. It's been a it's been a joy. All right. Well, we'll talk to you again soon, Dr. Ginn. Thanks very much. Thank you, Judge Wise. Well, I hope you learned a lot from Dr. Jody Ginn. It's fascinating to learn how the pros help preserve and promote Texas history. So let's help them out. Go get involved in some of the associations. Do some research on what interests you and get involved with the great history of this state. Well, that wraps it up for this episode of Wise About Texas. Send me some feedback on who you'd like to hear me interview and topics you'd like me to cover on the show. Don't forget to like and share the Wise About Texas Facebook page and follow the show on Twitter at Wise About Texas and the same on Instagram. I want to thank all the patrons of the show. If you'd like to support the show financially, go to patreon.com. That's www.patreon.com slash wiseabouttexas and throw a little support behind the preservation and promotion of Texas history. Well, thanks for listening. Go out and do something for Texas today. And until next time, God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road. Mm-hmm.